Okay. Yeah, where the fuck is it? Where the fuck?
Okay. What? Okay. Okay.
Hey, Marco. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. And okay. uh, you can hear me? Yeah, yeah. How's it going? Oh, fine enough. And you? Good. Uh, well, it, uh, it's funny. Uh, technology always has problems. You you can count on them being... They I don't know how it, the link was changed. Oh, really? Yeah, I went to... Uh, to go open and zoom and it dis it disappeared. Mm. Yeah, I got I yeah, I guess you're open you, yeah, you're open on YouTube. You're open on YouTube. Uh, or am I open on YouTube? I maybe. Just a moment. Okay. Can you repeat please? Yeah, yeah, I was on another channel, that's why I heard another noise. Oh, okay, okay. No, it was my hand cough. Uh, uh i i make the wrong jacket okay now i'm listening and okay okay i'm just sending out now to the all of my facebook followers ah, okay the new yeah. link yeah in fact i tried the the, the, the former link but uh was uh it didn't work expired so, yeah yeah and i noticed expired. i said and no, then i went back and said where's the conference disappeared yeah, exactly. You know, the the uh, Zoom is not perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, if I tell them that, they'll say, oh, it, you made a mistake. But no, no, I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that they just dropped it, dropped it, the ball. It's not mm -hmm. perfect. You just got to do the best you can, you know. Of course, of course, like uh, every technology, uh, sometimes it can, uh, can happen. Yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised it doesn't happen more in conferences. <laughs> There's a lot of technology involved in the PowerPoint and setting up the, you know, the screen. I saw one conference in San Francisco. This is the worst I've ever seen in San Francisco. You, mm. would, ex you would expect the best technology of anywhere on the planet as far as video technology. The conference, they, they screwed up the system so bad, Great. the conference was delayed like an hour. And oh, they had all gosh. kinds of people looking at it was, it was the worst I've ever seen. Oh, really? Yeah, and I'm surprised yeah. it doesn't happen more often, but uh, most of the time things happen pretty smoothly. Yeah, of course. Uh, even even the, the, the space missions sometimes have some problems. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The guys that work with it all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm finding that, that they don't know much more about technology than most people. <laughs> The techs, yeah. they should know more about video because that's their job. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they, these technologies are going to take over. And if they don't get changed, they're going to be they lose a job. Of course, right. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be so easy to have conferences with, with smartphones. Mm. And uh, I think it'll get easier to set up. <laughs> oh, you're zoom, not paying attention here. Oh, there's Ulrich. There's Ulrich. Yeah. Hello, man. 
Hello, Dr. Meloni. Hello, Dr. John. Hey, how, how are you? you? Yeah, fine, thanks. And you? Zoom changed the link on me. Yeah, I noticed that. I noticed. Oh, man, I went back. And I don't think it was a mistake I made. It could have been, but I don't think so. But uh, I go back to look for the conference and it disappeared. I said, where is it? Where's the conference? And uh, mm. Oh, well, at, at least at least you were able to save the day and get a new link. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope we didn't lose many viewers, but, but I got to send up some emails now. Yeah, let, well, wrong with this? Okay, there we go. Okay, I'll be back in a few minutes. Of course. Hey, spend a few months in Lacomo with uh, Dr. Maloney. Uh, sorry, in Como. Mm. Yeah, I was looking at the map. I was looking at the map where it's at and everything. Mm. It's a big lake, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, a, it's very big. One of the biggest in Italy. Uh, but it's very beautiful. Very beautiful. He, he takes from the northern part of Italy to the... Uh, uh, until the uh, most Emilia Romagna. That is... Uh, it's very long, <laughs> very long, but very okay. beautiful as well. Mm, absolutely. Uh, and uh, for, fortunately, the, the, the weather is going better. So we are having uh, many tourists, uh, a lot of people. Uh, today, I, uh, I visited a, a couple uh, of, from the United Kingdoms. Uh, oh, okay. Mom, mom, dad, uh, grandma, grandpa, so all the family. <laughs> mm. <laughs> no, nothing, nothing special, fortunately. Just uh, a, a, a little baby that uh, fell down, uh, hit his head, but it was no commotive uh, trauma. She was pretty, pretty, pretty well. Uh, so I, uh, I just uh, take the, the right observation and I discharge that at home. So, because she was very uh, perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I'm sure. I'm sure the family was happy to to, to hear about that. They were probably bothered that the uh, that the holidays would be so spoiled with them being in the hospital in Italy. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> mm. uh, uh, if you consider uh, that, uh, by definition, uh, stay in hospital is uh, uh, boring. Uh, uh, but then, mm. if you are a tourist yeah. and you spend days and days staying in hospital, uh, uh, but in uh, outside to have tourists, mm. okay, it's your daughter. So he, the best things that you have to think is uh, the. Yeah. Uh, your culture, anyways, uh, uh, is now a um, happy situation, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it is. Really, was uh, everything is going go going for the best. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm. I was in operating room this morning. Uh, we operate uh, a temporary insular glioma. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Did it go well? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it was uh, it went well. Uh, fortunately, it was a glioblastoma, so oh, okay. pretty bad, pretty bad. Anyway, the surgery go go well. In fact, the patients uh, uh, didn't suffer any hemiplegia, any uh, cognitive uh, deficit. Uh, we just checked him uh, uh, at the uh, stopping of sedation and uh, is uh, is stay is is well. Oh, so, okay. Hopefully. And now he he, he need a long uh, a long road with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. He's pretty young, uh, forty nine years old. Mm. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, uh, uh, Marco. Uh, tell me. Could you tell, um, uh, Ulrich, can you send the links, please, to Nauru? And then maybe okay. he passes it out. Let me, you got the links, right? The new links? Yes, yes, yes I do. They, uh, of course. Zoom, Zoom changed them on me, so it was yeah. difficult. So we got to okay. deal with it. 
please send them to, I can't send Nauru the links. And he has some students coming with him, I think. <coughs> okay. Uh, you provide you, Hurik, or I provide my. Well, um, I have his contact, so I'll just send it straight away. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Facebook blocks, sending links, a, a lot of links. Oh, here, oh, here's a new doc. Good, from Myanmar. Great. Mm. Mm -hmm. Shen Yu. Shen Yu from Germany. Great. 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 Mm. Uh, just sorry, I leave you one minute uh, because I need to okay. Okay. make it all interesting. Okay. Okay. okay, great. Hi, uh, oh, Sun, Sun Yu. Uh, Shen Yu, Shen Yu, I'm going to unmute you, okay? Okay, you can hear me now, Shen Yu, right? Okay. Hello. Hello, Sun Yu, can you hear me? Oh, she must be at a Wi-Fi. How are you doing, uh, Nauru? Hello, how are you? Good. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello, Eric. I hope you are well and you are ready to your presentation. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks. Okay, it's good.
Hey, it worked. I guess you're first, right? Can you hear me okay, Omar? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I'm okay. first. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Are you ready to roll? Uh, unfortunately, it was that screw up. I think they stayed, kept a lot of people away, some people away. But uh, that's part of the learning process. Mm -hmm. So, are you ready, Ulrich? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Yeah. 10, Anytime. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good, good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach from Neurosurgical TV. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of having. Um, Another in the continuing series of uh, neuroanatomy put on a uh, neuroanatomy uh, put on by the young neurosurgeons of Africa, and today we have the head of the young neurosurgeons of Africa, Ulrich Sydney, uh, is going to present on uh, neuroanatomy of the men meninges. And first, let's meet uh, the guest who's going to speak later. Hello, hello, Nuru. Could you please introduce yourself? Just unmute yourself there. Hello, John Bennett. Uh, hello, I am Nordin uh, Gonkal, uh, medical doctor. I am currently in uh, residency course on uh, WFNS Center in Rabat, but now I am uh, in Zurich, actually uh, to attend the Congress, uh, World Congress of Neuroscience and Neurology. Uh, so we finish uh, today uh, in a few moments, we finish this uh, Congress. And it, is, it will be a pleasure to me to join uh, my young colleague Ulrich Sidney to present uh, after his uh, presentation about anatomy, neuroanatomy of meningi. I will present uh, uh, meningiomas. So okay. thank you uh, for your invitation, John. Very good, very good, Daruva. Yeah, and I apologize to both of you. There has been a technical issue with Zoom uh, as far as the links, and I think some people got. You know, I sent the links out. I had the change the links at the last minutes. So otherwise, I think we'd have a full, few more yes, people. I see that. People, Ulrich. <laughs> okay, Ulrich, welcome, and it's all yours. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, John. So uh, I'm Ulrich Sydney, a funny uh, medical student from Cameroon and uh, a future research associate at Harvard's Programming Global Surgery and Social Change. Um, we, are gonna, we created a group called... Uh, Association of Future African Neurosurgeons, and we uh, thought it wise to be presenting uh, uh, this pre to have presentations on neuroanatomy, and we were lucky enough to to have Neurosurgical TV to host us online and to the world, and we are joined today by Dr. Nuru, who has already presented himself, who is a resident from uh, was currently in Rabat, which is a training center for the WFNS. So without further ado, we'll be starting uh, our presentation. So I'll be going first. I'll be talking about the neuroanatomy, histology, and physiology for the meninges. Uh, and Dr. Nuru will be talking about meningioma. Meningiomas in, okay. Just a moment there. Yeah, right. You're gonna make it, yeah, there, there we go. Okay, so Beautiful. Uh, the meninges, are, uh, uh, they, they come from the Greek word meninges, which is a membrane. The three of them, from the exterior to the interior, we have the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. Dura mater because it's, um, a tough uh, tissue, whereas the arachnoid looks like a spider web and the pia mater is tender. The pia mater is actually intimately linked to uh, the brain the brain parenchyma, so it's, it's difficult to, to divide it, to separate it from the brain parenchyma. So in this um, 
uh, diagram, we have uh, uh, the different layers getting to the to, to the meninges. We have the scalp, and uh, below this scalp, we have um, obviously blood vessels. We have the periosteum, the uh, the skull with the external table, the diploid, the internal table, and finally we get to the meninges. So with the meninges, we first of all find this leathery tough. Uh, covering, which is the dura mater, which has two layers. We'll be talking about it later. And below this, we have the, um, the arachnoid membrane, and finally the pia mater. We'll equally be describing the spaces around these meninges uh, uh, further on. So we always begin our descriptions with embryology. So these uh, coverings for uh, the central nervous system uh, developed from peri uh, the perimedullary uh, mesenchyme, and they develop around the third uh, month of um, intrauterine growth. That's around the seventh week for the pachymenix, which is the dura mater, and around the eighth, ninth week for the leptomenix, which is uh, the arachnoid membrane and um, the pia mater. Uh, leptomeninges actually form from the neural crest. As a, as a reminder, we, we, we know that from the, um, uh, uh, neural, the, the neural tube, tube will uh, join to form the, ne the neural crest, excuse me, will join to form the neural tube from which we will obtain uh, the central nervous system. So sub subsequently, neural differentiation occurs from sclerotomes, uh, which are part of metamers because we have um, dermatomes, myotomes, and then sclerotomes. And this will uh, later on be very helpful to understand how um, certain diseases which concern uh, not just the meanings can equally uh, concern the, the vertebra, which is the bone and, and the skin. It's the case with spinal dysraphism like uh, um, spina bifida, be the apeta or culta cases. So embryologically, we have this um, diagram that brings us back to the phylogeny. Here uh, we have, for example, the lamprey, the lamprey here, and then we have uh, the Acantia uh, species. So uh, the, 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 a few, there are a few differences, but the, the common features are the very meanings which you can find and then the primitive meanings. Around here, this is the, the spinal cord. And then this is, from this, we um, can further envision how the, 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 what the development in the human, in the human being can, uh, it is like. So the jura will differentiate from the development of the skull as the venous sinuses, because the jura has two layers. We'll be describing more. We have a periosteal layer and a, and a meningeal layer. And when these uh, meningeal layers fold back on themselves, they, they, this, they define spaces within which we will have venous blood. And then these spaces will form what we have, what we call venous sinuses. We'll be describing them equally later. So the tica condensation forms the periosteal layer, which is the external part. And then the tino one forms the meningeal layer. So the dural matter is derived from the mesoderm. And like we said, is this white leathery inelastic membrane. And it really participates in the protection of the central nervous system from external aggressions, be it uh, physical or chemical or infectious, biological, I mean. So uh, we already described it two uh, layers. We see that the periosteal layer is intimately linked to the internal table of the skull. Or uh, here it's part of the cranial vault. It can also be the, 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 the base of the, of, of the skull. Whereas the meningeal dura here, meningeal dura, will separate the periosteal dura from uh, the arachnoid. So the way we see it in this diagram, what we see is that there are no, no spaces here. However, we'll be describing an epidural space. I will be describing a subdural space later on, which are actually pathological. So they, they're not supposed to exist. The periosteal layer consists of fibroblasts and osteoblasts, which explains why this periosteal layer is really tough. It's really uh, strength, um, strong in ten tensile strength. And then the two layers are mostly fused and only separating to form the venous sinuses and dura reflections. Talking about the venous sinuses, so the venous sinuses form 
uh, a great portion of um, uh, the, the venous uh, drainage, venous circulation for the central nervous system. That's the cerebral, um, the, 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 the cephalic portion of the central nervous system. And we can describe a number of venous sinuses. And uh, this venous sinus is formed because of, of spaces uh, between uh, the dural folds. So the major dural folds are the fault cerebri here, which we can see, which separates both hemispheres, that's the left from the right. And uh, another one is here, the the tentorium cerebelli. So, for example, in the Fox cerebri, we will find that we have a superior sagittal sinus, which runs anterior posterior and goes all the way back. And then we have an inferior sagittal sinus. And this uh, superior sagittal sinus at the level of the torcular, that's the confluence of sinuses, will meet up with the transverse sinus which is preceded by the, the sigmoid sinus. And here, um, coming out of the torcular, we'll have the occipital sinuses. We have other sinuses, which are uh, better viewed on this other diagram. Here, what we have is here, the cavernous sinus here. We equally have um, a superior petrosal sinus and an inferior petrosal sinus. We, as, uh, we equally have um, here, the uh, pareto sphenoidal sinus. And uh, here we can better visualize the occipital, occipital sinus. So once again, like we described, these are actually in between the dural folds, the dural sheets, which fall back on themselves. So the dural reflections, we come back to them. We've already described two of the main dural reflections, but the other ones. So we start with um, the main ones. Uh, primarily the fox cerebri. The fox cerebri, which is which has the form of um, uh, um, they call it. Well, he has he has come back. So um, uh, all this instrument for the dead. Ah, he'll come back. So he has this sickle shell sickle cell shape. This sickle cell shape, and um, it divides, like we said, the right from the left left hemisphere, and um, we, we can find it joining here below the tentorium cerebelli. And at this uh, junction here, we have a sinus equally. So what we get is one compartment on the, on the right here, one compartment on the left, and one compartment below, which is actually the posterior fossa. So the fourth cerebri, which is this dural, fold here, and here will be this, the, the, the sagittal, superior sagittal sinus, attaches to the crystal galli. The crystal galli, which we described last week, when we're talking about the edmoid bone. The crystal galli is um, this projection that comes out of the crystal blood uh, of the edmoid and goes um, superior. That's anteriorly, and then posteriorly, we have a, a, an attachment on the tentorium cerebelli. So that at the junction of the tentorium and the fourth cerebri, which is the faco tentorial junction, we have uh, the straight sinus. There is an opening in the fourth cerebri, which is known as the tentorium incisura or notch, that allows the midbrain to uh, pass through into the middle cranial fossa. And then when the midbrain passes through this um, uh, tentorium uh, notch or incis incisura, we can describe um, spaces which are anterior, middle, and posterior. So literally, anterior to the midbrain, uh, on the same in the same plane with the midbrain, and posterior to the midbrain. Uh, the superior margin of the fourth cerebri, like we described before, contains the superior sagittal sinus, whereas the inferior margin contains the inferior sagittal sinus. Um, so, for the superior margin, this will be it, where we'll find the superior sagittal sinus, and then the inferior sagittal sinus will be here. Over here, and then this is the falco tentorial junction where we can find the the the, the straight the straight sinus. So the the next one up is the tentorium cerebellum, which is basically the roof of the cerebellum. So it's a its free margin is the incisura, which we already described, and we said the incisura permitted um, the passage of the midbrain. So uh, from this aspect, we could describe um, three spaces, which we've already spoken about. Now the incisura borders anteriorly 
uh, we have the petrous ridge, which helps to have the, the separate the middle from the posterior uh, fossa. And uh, posteriorly, we have the internal occipital protuberance. The attachments of the tentorium on the petrous bone and the clinoid process processes form the anterior and posterior petroclinoid and the interclinoid folds, which gives what we call the oculomotor triangle. So, once again, here, at the interim cerebri, here. So this is the space where we can find the midbrain passing through, here. Now, within this, uh, we have a, a little space, which we call the diaphragma cilli, which is um, the space that lets uh, pass through the pituitary stalk. And this diaphragma stele is a horizontal meningeal fold attaching to the four clinoid processes and forming the roof of the cella tussica in which we find the, the hypothesis. So we can equally describe a fourth cerebelli, which like the fourth cerebri will be separating both hemispheres of the cerebrum, of the cerebellum, excuse me, and uh, giving us the left and the right. We can equally describe a, a particular reflection in this case, the meaning, meaningful orbital band. The meaningful orbital band, like its name describes, is formed of mm, meninges, which is, in this case, the dura mater. And we find it at the level of, uh, at the proximity of the superior orbital fissure. And this meaningful orbital band is very uh, important in skull based surgery, especially for uh, uh, skull based surgery around the, the Cavernous sinus. So last week, uh, I think that was Sunday, we had a, a very interesting lecture with Professor Ipshiran, who was talking about uh, clinodectomies, intradural and extradural clinodectomies. And we saw in the extradural approach that uh, the meaningful orbital band, band was uh, very, very important in, in accessing the, the clinoid because we had to, uh, first of all, go and uh, drill the lateral border of the superior orbital fissure. Then we had to uh, incise the, the dura. We had to reflect the dura of the temporal lobe. And that way, we could get access to the clinoid. And then we could do our uh, extra dural clinoidectomy, which was very helpful for, the, for us to access um, a certain number of, um, of uh, aneurysms and equally to get that um, uh, pericavernous dissection. Very interesting, equally in cases of um, cystenostomy, in cases of trauma. So it's not just important in cases of um, aneurysmal uh, surgery, but equally in neurotrauma. So the, the dural matter uh, is uh, continuous with only from, not only from the cranial part, but equally with the spinal part. So the dural matter, as we can see, for the cranial part here is in blue, whereas the, the part for the, the spine is here in a, a purplish pink color. So this continuity has uh, surgical implications because uh, surgical procedures that need uh, opening of the foramen magnum require cautious dissection of the dura mater if the opening of the latter is not necessary. So its ventral part strongly adheres to the dorsal aspect of the second and third cervical vertebral bodies. So um, very important. And if we're not careful, we, we will end up with um, um, CSF leak in, uh, in the post-operative period. The next, uh, mm, the next meninx we are going to describe here is the first part of the leptomeninx, which is the arachnoid matter, which we define already arachnoid because looking like a spider web. And it's derived from the ectoderm. It's an avascular membrane, and it's very involved in the CSF metabolism, principally via the uh, granulations, arachnoidal granulations. So uh, it consists of a superficial mesothelial layer below the dura, a central layer composed of cells conjoined by many junction proteins, and a deep layer of less tightly packed cells. So the consequence here is that since the cerebrospinal fluid is um, found in the subarachnoid space, the arachnoid membrane actually participates in the resorption of the cerebrospinal fluid from the subarachnoid space 
into the, the, the dural sinuses, the vena, uh, dural venous sinuses. And like we said, the dural venous sinuses are actually spaces that are defined within the dura. So the arachnoid is an interface between, on the one part, the CSF, and on the other part, venous blood. Very important, therefore, in the metabolism of, of CSF. Um, the arachnoid has sheet-like and filiform trabeculae that join the deep surf, um, surface of the arachnoid to the pia mater. So there's equally this communication between the arachnoid and the underlying meanings, which is the pia mater. And within the center of this trabeculae are a course of collagen fibers that extend from the inner layer of the arachnoid to the sub PR connective tissue on the surface of the membrane. A few um, important uh, structures operatively, of course, uh, first of all, the Lilliquist membrane. So the Lilliquist membrane is um, a fold of arachnoid matter, which um, extends anterior, anteriorly from uh, the post the, the posterior aspect of the cella tussica and then goes, uh, uh, goes all the way to the mammillary bodies. It has three portions. It has um, a, a, a cellar portion, it has a diencephalic portion, and it equally has a mesencephalic portion. Now the arachnoid matter in this area, which is the liliquist membrane, also helps give some form of separation between the two uh, cisternae. That is, in front, we have the supra um, cella cisterna, cisterna, which is um, also called the uh, uh, chiasmatic uh, cisterna. And behind, we have um, the interpeduncular cisterna. Now, in a few cases, that's about, from literature, we have about we said, 10 to 13% of cases, we can have complete obstruction or obturation of this of this membrane in such a way that there's no communication between the supracellar cisterna and the interpeduncular cisterna. Why is this important for the neurosurgeon? Well, because if the neurosurgeon goes on to do a third ventricle, um, and a third ventriculostomy endoscopically, the, 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 the risk here is that there will be no communication, given that there will be no communication between the interpeduncular cisterna and the supracellar cisterna, uh, there's a risk of hydrocephalus, which was still present before uh, intervention. So it's important that in these cases, pair operatively, there should be a fen fenestration of the liliquis membrane. On the other hand, in the case of um, cystenostomy as well, the liliquis membrane is very, very helpful because uh, like we remember in cystenos, the, the, the concept behind cystenostomy is that uh, we have CSF shift edema because um, there is CSF in the cisterna, which can communicate with the interstitial space and can help relieve the edema at the level of the parenchyma. So we want to get communication between these um, spaces and the exterior and then drain, uh, drain, drain the, the CSF and reduce uh, the intracranial pressure. So access of this uh, liliquis membrane is very important. Another equally important uh, um, uh, aspect of the arachnoid uh, matter is arachnoid cysts, which are congenital and are very, they're seldom as, uh, symptomatic, they're very asymptomatic usually. Uh, important because uh, the treatment usually is conservative, but the diagnosis of an arachnoid cyst um, uh, imposes uh, certain differential diagnosis, like for example, epidermoid uh, uh, cysts, for example. And we find out that from the literature we, that we've had the references, um, arachnoid cysts, even when they are large, as they, they rarely come about with, um, with, uh, with symptoms. So given that the treatment is usually uh, asymptomatic, as opposed with its differential diagnosis, it's, it's important for the surgeon to be able to recognize arachnoid cysts. Now, uh, talking about the, the subarachnoid space, the subarachnoid space, like we said, is a space in which we can find the cerebrospinal fluid. So it participates in the circulation of um, CSF. And we know already that once CSF is produced in the uh, lateral ventricles, 
it goes through the uh, foramen of uh, it goes through foramen of Monroe to access the third ventricle, then aqueduct, the, the aqueduct of Silvius, and then fourth ventricle, medially the foramen of Magenti, and laterally the Lushka to get into the subarachnoid spaces. And we said in the subarachnoid spaces, the granulations of Pacioni at the level of the arachnoid membrane will permit resorption of the CSF into the venous uh, sinuses. The other thing we need to describe in a subarachnoid space, obviously, is the cisternae. So we have multiple cisternae at the level of the base. Among them, we have, uh, we already spoke about a few of them, like the, the supracellular cisterna. We spoke about the interpeduncular cisterna. We can equally speak, speak about the prepointine cisterna. We um, equally have the premedullary cisterna, cisterna magna, and uh, the uh, cisterna ambience. So these are spaces which are dilated in the subarachnoid space and that can contain CSF. And once again, which are very important, especially in the case of cystenostomy, for example. Now we get to the pia mater. The pia mater, like we said, is a part of the meninx, the leptomeninx, but it's intimately linked to the brain parenchyma. Like the arachnoid, it's derived from the ectoderm and it's composed of two layers. We have an epithelial layer and an intrapathial layer. So the pia mater uh, has a particular relationship with um, the vessels. And this helps define what we call virtual rubbing spaces, which uh, can be found between the blood vessels. So we have a blood vessel here, and then we have the, the virtual rubbing space. This space is actually full, filled with CSF, and this space Herbs, it's sort of an interface between, on the one hand, the, the vessel, and on the, other, on the other hand, the interstitial space. So it helps regulation between the interstitial space and the intravascular space. Very important e equally in uh, um, the understanding of certain pathologies and in the, fu in fu in the future with the uh, treatment of certain neuro neurological and neurosurgical diseases. Uh, we can equally describe a few barriers, a blood-brain barrier and a blood-CSF barrier. Now, we get to the blood supply of these meanings. Uh, the blood supply here in the epidural space and dura matter, the major arteries that supply the dura are derived from the internal carotid artery, the vertebral, the vertebral, the maxillary, ascending pharyngeal, lacrimal, occipital, and modal arteries. The middle meningeal artery, which is very important in the case of um, Epidural hematomas, we'll be talking again about it. It's actually a branch uh, of the maxillary artery, which is a branch of the external carotid artery. Uh, we have a venous drainage here, which is done by satellite veins, which all go to the dural venous sinuses. Via veins like the vein of, of Labe and the vein of Galen and uh, the internal cerebral vein. Talking about the lymphatic system, here we have a lymphatic system for uh, the dural aspect of the meninges, and then we have a lymphatic system which is uh, P also linked to the parenchyma. For the, meningi the meningeal uh, lymphatic vessels, they run tangentially to the dural venous sinuses and meningeal arteries, and they connect to deep cervical lymph nodes. Uh, they, they serve in waste elimination. Whereas when we speak about the uh, lymphatic circulation for the PL or uh, parenchyma. This is what we was termed recently and found recently as being the lymphatic system. And like we described already, uh, it's, in, it's intimately linked to the virtual rubbing spaces. These spaces that we described as being um, uh, between the red blood vessels and then the PL membrane. Uh, this space drains this space permits communication. The CSF will drain into the lymphatic system thanks to uh, the arterial pulsatility, respiration, and CSF pressure changes. And obviously, we've already spoken about the exchange between the, in, uh, the interstitial uh, compartment and then the CSF compartment. Innervation of the dura, principally, we have branches of the fifth cranial nerve. That's uh, 5 1 of Thalmic. Uh, five two, that's the maxillary. So we equally have participation from the first three um, cervical nerves and a portion of the sympathetic. 
In this diagram, what we see is um, color coded. We have uh, here at the level of the tenterum cerebelli, we have innervation, which is common with the four cerebri, which are branches of the, the of V1, which is the ophthalmic. Uh, in this temporal fossa here, we have the V3, which is the mandibular uh, uh, division, whereas V2 is more medial here. But we, we equally have the first three um, cervical nerves, which participate in the innervation of the meanings. So they can be, being given that they are innervated, they can be source of pain and therefore headache, for example. Whereas the brain, as we know, uh, doesn't have pain, pain uh, receptors. Um, this was this. Now, about the pathology of the spaces, which we had to define. Like we said, um, above the dura matter, we have an epidural space. Now, the epidural space is doesn't exist um, anatomically. So it's constituted when there's um, a pathological phenomenon. For example, in the case of collection of blood, as it is the case with uh, hematomas. Epidural hematomas, like it's the case here, we can see uh, coagulated blood here, which has the typical uh, biconvex aspect. Biconvex because the dura is intimately linked to the, the bone tissue. We said the dura had two layers, a periosteal layer and uh, um, a meningeal layer. The periosteal layer is intimately linked to the internal table of the, of the calvarium, and it is it stops at levels of sutures. So this makes these epidural spaces very limited. And given that the, the, of the cause of this epidural hematoma is usually arterial, the, mean, the middle meningeal artery, usually by a, a fracture of the temporal bone, which is um, soft in that portion, very thin. So we have arterial blood that constitutes at high pressure and quickly. And at the end of the day, we get this really uh, voluminous, massive, um, constitute, massively constituted hematoma and signs with the very uh, famous lucid interval with a patient that presents, um, for example, loss of consciousness, who might re he might regain and then later on degrade um, really rapidly. So in this uh, CT scan, we can uh, clearly identify a massive uh, hematoma uh, presenting as a spontaneous hyperdensity and a midline shift, very important midline shift and effacement of the ventricles. Another um, important, equally important, uh, subdural space. So, in the subdural space, we have um, uh, hematomas that can get constituted. In this case, however, usually the cause is um, lesion to the bridging veins. So. The bridging veins, once they get um, injured, they will spill venous blood, which will go at a very low pressure. So this is uh, this will usually constitute itself slowly, and it will constitute itself slowly. The patient will not manifest signs immediately. So usually, what we get is this chronic subdural hematoma. And given that the spaces in the subdural uh, this, this subdural space is not limited by sutures, it's going to uh, go all the way around the hemisphere, homo, ho, uh, holo hem, hemispheric, and get this um, lenticular aspect. Now, we don't only have uh, chronic subdural hematomas, we equally have acute um, subdural hematomas. So this is the uh, subdural hematoma, which is chronic, because we can see here uh, hypodensity. This is acute. We can see there that the blood is uh, still fresh from the fact that it's hyperdense. This is acute on chronic. And here we have a difference for the classical aspect. Obviously, there are a few, uh, a, a few um, exceptions. For the classical aspect, on the right here, we have this lemon bicon biconcave aspect, biconvex aspect, aspect, excuse me, biconvex aspect, looking like a lemon. That's an epidural hematoma. On the left, we have this banana-shaped uh, uh, chronic um, acute subdural hematoma because here it's hyperdense. Now, um, all the causes of subdural, um, subdural hematomas besides trauma, we can equally um, have um, anticoagulant therapy. 
It's usually the case uh, usually found with uh, in patients who are a little bit older, about oh. 65 years of age. And uh, these patients uh, um, have a history of a really minor head, minor head trauma, one that they might even have forgotten. Uh, other things that can collect in this subdural space, we have um, hygromas. So this is just a, a, a schema of hygromas. Particularity in terms of surgery, an uh, acute subdural hematoma will form a uh, coagulation. So it's uh, not very fluid, it's very compact. Whereas the subdural, um, chronic subdural hematoma will be very fluid. So in the case of an acute subdural hematoma, we will tend to go and create, um, do a craniotomy to go and take out this clot, which is really compact and composed. In the case of a chronic subdural hematoma, which is really liquid, we can have a few burr holes and then drain and rinse, uh, obviously with the uh, destruction of any false membranes that we find there. Other types of hematomas in the spaces, we have the subarachnoid space, which can have a hematoma the, or hemorrhage. So the subarachnoid space, like we said before, is this space where we have CSF. And this is space where we have CSF communicates with other spaces that we described as being dilated spaces in which we find CSF, which we call cisterna, cisternae. So here we can have what we call subarachnoid hemato uh, hemorrhages or hem um, hematomas, which are usually the due to uh, trauma, which can equally be due to uh, aneurysma rupture. So in this schema here, what we have is um, an aneurysm at the level of the cevian fissure. Here we have the insula, temporal lobe. And here we have this uh, cisterna, which is um, filled with blood here, which we can appreciate. And this is a, a, a live specimen with which, uh, which has had um, aneurysm, um, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, on the CT scan, what we, what we can appreciate here is we have, we have spontaneous hyperdensity here around, around the, the midbrain. Now, these hematomas uh, occupy some space and they put into place a uh, Monroe Kelly doctrine so they cause um, an increase in the intracranial pressure. And once there's a uh, decompensation on the part of the, the autoregulatory system, the risk here is herniation. The, a few herniations depending on the, the area which will have the hematoma. Here in the, in the very first diagram, we have an epidural hematoma here, which is, in the, which is temporal. And the consequence here is that the oncal aspect of the temporal lobe Will herniate. This is the dural fold we call the tentorium cerebelli. So we have the oncus here that's going towards the, the, the posterior fossa. And the consequence here will be compression of the third nerve, which will be manif which will manif manifest itself as a modification of the papillary diameter. So following the papillary diameter can be interesting, although not uh, the, the most sensitive uh, examination. We can equally have a collection of blood in the subfrontal um, space here, in the posterior, in the posterior fossa as well. This is just um, a, a burst temporal lobe, which is a little bit different from this epidural hematoma. Given that we equally have the corticospinal tracts that go here, so usually this kind of lesion will be accompanied with um, a contralateral pyramidal syndrome. Uh, which we objective, which we have here as a, a positive Babinski sign. So yeah, these were our references, and uh, thanks for your attention. Okay, very good. You know, I gotta stop your screen sharing there. Very good, uh, Ulrich, you're ahead of your time. A uh, great presentation. Okay, uh, Marco came a little bit after you began. Hello, Marco. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, Sorry, I was uh, I'm on call uh, this, uh, this weekend, so sometimes I have to move uh, to answer to some call. It's okay. It. Thanks for coming. Any comments uh, for Ulrich as an aspiring neurosurgeon? 
Marco? Oh, well, uh, just one thing, uh, my best congratulation because uh, it's a, a presentation uh, uh, perfect uh, because you uh, join anatomy with uh, neurological uh, daily uh, cleaning. It's uh, absolutely uh, beautiful. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, save, save that presentation uh, over. Can we give it again the rest of your career <laughs> and be polishing it up and updating it, etc. Cet, etc. But I mean, that's do you hold a lot of presentations, Marco, that you give at different occasions and kind of edit them and update them? Sorry, can you repeat, John? Yeah, sure. When you have a presentation you have to give, do you have a, a set of old presentations you've given? that you kind of update before you give it again, or you just give it once and forget it? Mm. Um, Do you know what well, I mean? Uh, not exactly. Uh, you, mm. Okay, like, like so for example, you, you gave a presentation like Ulrich gave. You keep it, obviously, and then perhaps you present it in a year or two years when you want to give a lecture to students or, or something, so that you build up an archive of your presentations. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely is a, absolutely a good idea because uh, we are uh, doing uh, um, a, every panel uh, aspect very important for the, uh, uh, the, the beginning at the neuro, neurosurgery residency. Uh, so uh, to have uh, this, uh, uh, this panel and to uh, um, uh, and to uh, to have this uh, um, this bibliography, we can say, in neurosurgical TV, uh, to to study, to uh, uh, to um, see again uh, some uh, some topics uh, is absolutely a good idea, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I, I, now today's the day, I think, of the video portfolio. When you apply exactly. to a fellowship or a position, uh, you include some videos like this one. Ulrich can can present gives his. Uh, somewhere where they have an idea of who the person is, to see them interacting, especially in the neurosurgery field. Uh, anyways, Nuru, you have any comments or questions for uh, uh, Ulrich? Yes, thank you, John. Thank you, Ulrich, uh, for your brilliant uh, presentation. It is uh, clear. And uh, I will go ahead uh, to present uh, Menangioma to contribute. Uh, okay. Okay, I don't know if we're ready. We can formally end this uh, if we want. Any other comments or questions, Marco, before we move on to uh, Nauru? Um, no. Yes, you pretty well said it. You pretty well said everything. I'm making. <laughs> I'm trying to make you speak, speak a lot. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Thank you, John. <laughs> well, you know, you know, I don't know. Hope you don't mind, uh, Nauru. Can we take a couple of minutes? Uh, and we don't have to do it. You can you can tell me I'm crazy. You think it's a, a, a dumb idea, but Ola, could you take us around Cameroon and show kind of orient us to the country and where you're at and stuff? Yeah, but you you will yeah. have to you have to to share the the the, the map because you know. Yeah, yeah, I'll is... do it. Yeah, no problem, yeah. no problem. Yeah, I'll okay. do it. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it because I think I'm probably like a lot a lot of, of viewers. It's essentially. I honestly did not know exactly where Cameroon was. Um, and let me, let me uh, Cam. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And I hope to do the same with uh, Morocco. Because uh, I'm sure Nauru could. Uh, bring us around Morocco. Okay, let me just enlarge a little bit. Okay, here we are. Now you're at y Yao Rundi. Uh, okay, so yeah, so where you are is the um, Yaoundé. That's okay. the capital city. Yes. That's how you pronounce it, Yaoundé. 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 Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so you you have another city uh, at the level of the sea, the Douala. Douala. Can you see that? That's support, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that that's the economic capital. So in Cameroon, those are the big two cities, Yaoundé on the one hand, and on the other hand, on the other hand, we have uh, Douala. Yaoundé because it's the administrative capital. You have all the the 
the the the, the, the ministers and the capital, presidents. The uh, yeah, that's where really the documents yeah, for the business. You 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 have to go to to Douala. Along the coastline, you have a, a few really amazing uh, beach uh, spots. You have Kribi, okay. which you oh, can Kribi see out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really amazing, John. You have all the seafood. You know, you have the sunshine, yellow sun. Uh, okay. it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Kribi, huh? uh, besides Kribi, you have Limbe as well on the coastline. Now, so is you, that the place? There's a place a waterfall comes to the ocean. Are you exactly, know? exactly. Is that exactly. creepy? Is that oh, creepy? yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, John, oh, wow. you know about it. Yeah, it's amazing. Like, yeah, you, you, I, I, I'll try to get the I'll try yeah, to get pictures yeah, it's right now great. because they were, they were really, uh, really incredible. So you, you, you will find yourself with um, uh, really uh, lake water on one side and then if just two, three meters of, of sand and then you have salty water. So on the one hand, you have all these uh, fish for from the from the from for, from the rivers and the lakes, and then on the other hand, you have all these amazing Atlantic Ocean fish. Yeah, okay. that's it. Okay. Yeah, there we, I, go. there we go. Let me let's take it on a little tour. Then. Yes, yes, oh, yes. It's an amazing, it's an amazing, amazing coastline. Really beautiful. Let me see if I can get this, Marco. There's a waterfall that actually. There it is in the background. You see the background there. Yeah, uh, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's the waterfall. See the waterfalls. You, I'm, I'm sure that you can get that. You can get that in a in a in in a traditional boat, and then you you actually go close to it, and then see how it falls into the. That's it. That look at that coastline. Look at that coastline, John. Look at that water. That's that. That's yeah. That's ocean, the waterfall. Right? That's, that's the waterfall. The ocean, right. So this is this is the waterfall getting. It's not yet the ocean here. This is the waterfall getting into the ocean. It's about, let me say, 20, 30 meters away. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it just continues into the ocean. Yeah, I wasn't familiar with any place that has a waterfall so close to the ocean uh, mm. in the world. I'm not sure I've seen I've ever seen any place. So mm. very good. Okay, let's go on to the room. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent. Put it in the resume. Yes. Thank you, Lyric, for your presentation. Yeah, I'd like to present okay, Nero, it's all yours. If you want to talk a few words about who you are and where you're at and stuff. Okay, I guess if you want to start, that's fine. Whatever. It is okay now. Yeah, uh, well, I think you need to make it a little bigger. Uh, bigger? Yeah, you need to adjust it a little bit. So, no, no. There's a, a at the bottom of the screen. There's an option. No, to the left of there, one of those screens will put it in right perspective. Uh, next to the there, one of the, to the left there. There you go. There you go. Perfect. You see it? Okay. You see it yourself, right? Yeah, it looks great. Yes. Um... Okay. Can I start, or I have to? Yeah, sure. It looks it looks great. Okay. So I will talk about uh, meningioma today. I will use this plan with the, the introduction, epidemiology, anatomy and, and pathology, and clinical consideration, uh, diagnosis, uh, diagnosis uh, radiology, surgical, I will talk about uh, surgical treatment, radiosurgery, gamma knife, outcome, conclusion, uh, and the reference. But uh, I have to clarify that uh, it is very, very um, big uh, topic. So I can I couldn't uh, tell uh, tell you about all about many different. Uh, it is uh, subsequence and concept and um, some summary about uh, uh, meningioma intracranial. So uh, meningioma is being a tumor of the second half of life. 76% of cases are observed after 50 years. Uh, we can have existence, existence of some form in young adults and children. And uh, there is a clear predominance of women which tend to decrease after menopause. Some authors have called for uh, the primary treatment of meningioma by surgery, whereas others have evolved their surgical role into decompressive. Partial remove to be followed by radiosurgery, that is the gold standard now. And uh, during uh, success in the total resection of an olfactory growth meningioma in, uh, 19, uh, in 1885, uh, began paving the way for treatment of meningiomas. Prognosis is generally good and favorable uh, in most 
that exists. A meningioma is in many ways the soul of neurosurgery and uh, the progress in meningioma treatment mirror advances in neurosurgery while advancements in neurosurgery are put to maximum use to improve the treatment of meningioma. That is not me, it is our big famous uh, Al Mefti Osama who say that. I will talk about epidemiology. Meningioma accounts for 33 uh, of all primary brain and central nervous system tumors reported in the United States between 2002 and 2006, and thus represent the most frequently diagnosed, uh, diagnosed primary brain tumor. With this in mind, researchers are examining the role of both genetic and environmental risk factor of this tumor. Family story studies suggest a role for inheritance for meningioma in uh, addition to the neurofibromatosis type 2 gene and genetic variant in gene involved in DNA repair pathway, uh, some of uh, which appear common to several tumor types have been implicated. Uh, the prevalence of meningioma is estimated to be um, 97 Point five uh, to 100,000 in the United States with more than uh, 116,000 individual current diagnosis with this tumor. About uh, epidemiology, we see that uh, uh, the specific uh, uh, incident rates in uh, 2000, 2000 uh, when you go to after 50 years, we have the, the big rate to 12.39 uh, to 34. So we, uh, that is the commonly, uh, uh, we have meningioma after 15 years. That is uh, uh, confirmed that with this uh, uh, epidemiology uh, research in uh, NFT books. Meningioma are the most common benign intracranial neoplasm, accounting for 30 to 26 percent of all intracranial tumors because they originate from meningothelial cells uh, found in the arachnoid layer of the meninge, like uh, Ulrich uh, uh, in uh, last uh, presentation about anatomy of meninge. The successful management of meningiomas demand comprehensive and understanding of the anatomy of meninge. Thank you, Ulrich, for your brilliant uh, presentation. Knowledge of meningeal architecture and it is osseous and neurovascular relationship provided the basis uh, for understanding the seat of origin and the roots of spread uh, of meningiomas. Successful operative strategy must account for both the tumor itself and its dural attachment. It's very important, uh, uh, this dural attachment in surgery. Only by eliminating uh, the affected dura and bone can the risk of recurrence be minimized. Familiarity with meningeal anatomy allows for the design of safe surgical approach to complex region of the cranial base uh, will minimizing uh, neurovascular injuries. Intraoperatively, the arachnoid layer provides an avascular plane uh, of dissection, it is very important, this arachnoid plane to done dissection, separating tumor from vital neurovascular uh, structures. The term meningi is attributed to erasis tractus, uh, before Jesus Christ, uh, 100 to 215, the, uh, the Greek, uh, Greek anatomist and royal physician to uh, Seleucus uh, Nicator of Syria. So I will not uh, stay here because he'll reach uh, down perfect illustration last time about anatomy uh, of uh, meningi. Uh, I will go ahead. And this is, I, I, will, I want to present this summary of the fine, fine uh, structural characteristics of meninge. We have uh, dura mata, we have arachnoid and pia mata. And it is important uh, to, uh, to know uh, 
this structural characteristic that uh, about cell characteristic uh, you about duram matter you can it is the cell, large cells uh, elongated somewhat of flattened fibroblast in varying orientation with extensive amount of intertwining extracellular collagen and when you say uh, we take uh, uh, arachnoid you can have a closely packed pump cells without any significant amount of extracellular space and pure matter just flattened fibroblast. And dura matter you can see about layer posterior uh, periosteal dura, meningeal dura, and dura border cells before you find uh, arachnoid barrier cells. We have a uh, uh, major cistern and uh, their contents. We have uh, about uh, a carotid uh, cistern. Uh, you have a uh, artery like ICA, origin of uh, uh, choroid anterior artery and uh, posterior communicant posterior. Uh, and the chiasmatic, you have uh, ACA. We can uh, find the cistern of Sylvian when we dissect to have a good brain, good brain uh, de uh, de uh, detention. MCA, artery MCA, uh, Sylvian uh, fronto, fronto orbital vein about the vein. Uh, cranial nerves uh, in the cistern ambient, you have uh, uh, the four cranial nerves. And uh, also I will not uh, uh, stay a, lo uh, a lot of uh, in uh, all these details. I will go ahead, but it is important to know the meningeal branch and area of, of uh, this supplement. We have uh, cavernous uh, carotid, ophthalmic artery, uh, um, anterior cerebral artery, and we have uh, vertebral uh, artery. So all these three uh, parts uh, come from ICA, and uh, after you will talk about uh, uh, vertebral uh, 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 basilary artery. So recurrent artery of foramen lacerum, that is the, about ICA. So you have dura of foramen lacerum and carotid canal. Uh, I showed this part when I talked last time uh, about uh, um, uh, noranatomy of sphenoid bone. And uh, I will go ahead. I will go ahead. Um, Summary about uh, dural innervation, ophthalmic nerve, muscular nerves. You already talked about all that. We go ahead. And uh, we can uh, talk about risk factor and uh, environmental factor in meningioma. It is coming to see ionizing radiation, hormone, uh, head trauma, cell phone use, association with breast cancer, genetic polymorphism, industry, occupation, diet, and allergy, and family history of meningium. All this is the risk factor uh, who can, uh, who, but I don't know, um, many, many studies uh, and clinical trials is uh, nowadays done to, to, to confirm all this risk factor. About localization, the majority of meningioma are supratentorial with a large number located along the convexity. Approximately 70 to 25 percent occur in a frontobasal location. However, only about 10 percent occur in the posterior fossa. Within the frontobasal region, the olfactory grooves, tuberculum cellae, Planum uh, uh, and the paracellular region and the petrous bone are preferred seats. Uh, Approximately 5% occur along the cerebellar convexity. 2 to 4% at the tenterum cerebelli and 2 to 4% within the cerebellopontine angle. Not, uh, le, uh, uncommonly, meningiomas are found within the ventricular system on a rise within the optic nerve sheet where they produce diffuse circumferential thickening of nerve uh, sheet rather than a focal mass. Notably, meningiomas are the most common trigonal intraventricular mass in adults uh, that come from uh, uh, choroid and toil, uh, toil choroid. A typical location including uh, those within the posterior fossa, brain parenchyma, and uh, ventricles are more frequent uh, in the pediatric population. So about histopathology, 
2007 World Health Organization classified meningioma like meningotelial meningioma for grade one, fibroblastic meningioma grade one, transitional mixed meningioma grade one, somatous meningioma grade one, microcystic meningioma for grade one, secretory meningioma grade one. Cordoid meningioma grad 2, clear cell meningioma grad 2, and papillary meningioma grad 3. You can have sometimes atypical meningioma grad 2, and rhabdoid meningioma and anaplastic uh, meningioma look like uh, malignant grad 3. About clinical uh, consideration, the advances in diagnosis technique and instrumentation had have led to an increase in the identification of incidental meningioma in the growing elderly population. In 1989, Kuratsu and uh, collaboration established the uh, uh, Kumamoto uh, University Brain Tumor Data Bank and between 1989 and 20, uh, 2008, 1,078 for new cases of meningioma were diagnosis. Of those, 40% were asymptomatic, no symptom. The rate of incidence of asymptomatic uh, meningiomas has increased in the past decade, and asymptomatic meningioma account for almost half of meningioma diagnosis. So about the symptoms, usually we can have headache, vomiting, uh, signs of ICP in, uh, increases. You can have hemiplegia. Uh, you can have seizure, uh, decrease the, of vision, canal nerve deficit, ataxia, esophthalmos, dipopia. You can have uh, uh, ptosis about uh, uh, that's just all these symptoms. Uh, uh, if we have to, to choose uh, one type, uh, one described type of meningioma, we can done specifically the, the, the symptom with, with that because it is not, um, it is, uh, it is uh, um, about region, localization of, of meningioma, you, we, 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 uh, we have uh, symptoms. But uh, here I just uh, enumerated all symptoms you can have. Look like uh, when you take location like uh, cerebellar, Symptoms, uh, who comes, uh, 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 it is the cerebellar signs, sign. Uh, when you say uh, convexity, you have seizure. When you say you, 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 we take a parasitical location, you have uh, uh, seizure, tenter, you have ophthalmoplegia, donc, uh, nerves, intracranial nerves uh, involvement. And uh, temporal basal, you can have hemiplegia. Folks, uh, you have dementia and sphenoid ridge. You can have gate distur uh, disturbance and frontal base. You can have uh, uh, frontal syndrome, uh, disorient uh, disorientation. And it is important uh, uh, to, uh, when uh, you have patient to know this uh, uh, Karnowski uh, status because it is important in 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 uh, outcome and and, and, and pro uh, pronostic. I go to talk about diagnostic radiology. So, meningioma is a central nervous system tumor characterized by indolent growth. It's the most common extraaxial lesion encountered in uh, neuroimaging. The high frequency of incidental diagnosis during neuroimaging for other, indi other indications reflect the fact that up to 2% of autopsy reveal a meningioma, although MRI is the imaging study of choice for evaluation of suspected meningioma or in the context of no or highly suspected pathology. CTs is highly accessible and indicated uh, for rapid screening in uh, urgent setting. Calcification are also typical of meningioma, but not pathognomony because other extraaxial neosplasm such as chondromas may also contain um, calcification. The morphology and volume of calcification are uh, varied. So we have here example of CT scan, uh, axial uh, view, a thin ring of low attenuation, fluid CSF around uh, here. Sorry, such my, yes. You see here, it is the pathogomoning. Uh, you have uh, attenuation of cerebrospinal uh, fluid trapped around 
la, la, la large left. This is feature indicated the extraacial nature of tumor. Because if it is not an uh, extraacial, you, you will not have this, uh, uh, you will not have uh, uh, this, this, this feature. So it is important to, 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 to recognize that and uh, don't difference about uh, intraaxial uh, uh, process and uh, extraaxial uh, uh, process. MRI, approximately 85 to 90% of meningioma have typical feature, including an extraaxial mass with, with signal intensity, is intense to cortex on T1 and T2 MRI uh, seconds. Every the homogeneous enhancement following administration of gadolinium contrast and enhancing dural tail, which reflect neuroplastic dural infiltration or reactive vascularity of bone draining into the adjacent dura. Meningiomas can be spherical or elongated like in plaque, multiple and uh, often take origin from a dural sinus, a feature important for surgical planning. This tumor also tend not to respect the dura boundary and may extend on bone side of the fault and tentorium, which is a distinctive feature not typically of other neuroplasms. We can have hyperostosis of bone and also be appreciated on MRI, particularly when fluorid uh, as seen with in plaque meningiomas. Hyperostosis appears as an area of thicker cortical bone with low signal intensity in T on T1 and T2 weighted the image. Edema associated uh, with uh, meningioma is thought to be vasogenic in origin and probably related to, uh, to tumor secretion of vascular endothelial growth factor rather than a result of direct mass uh, effect on adjacent brain or uh, venous invasion causing va uh, vascular conjunction. The presence of intraxial edema is said to predict an um, increased potential potential for recurrence. So I have example here, the typical appearance of meningioma on magnetic resonance um, uh, imaging, MRI. This picture, this uh, uh, picture uh, uh, figure, coronal post-contrast uh, T1 weighted MRI who demonstrate a very homogeneous enhancement uh, and dural tear, this it is, Dural tear here and here, dural tear, dural tear of convexity, uh, meningioma arising uh, from the dura overlying the right parietal lobe. Note that the sagittal sinus is separated from the meningioma by normal brain. And uh, figure B, we see here a large falcin meningioma does not respect the dural boundary and extend on both sides of the falx. You can see here again uh, coronal figure A in coronal T2, figure B post gadolinium T1 and C angiogram convention to demonstrate a left whole grad one paracella cavernum, cavernous sinus meningioma that uh, focally narrow the cavernous and supraclinoid, supraclinoid segment on the left internal carotid artery, internal carotid artery. And here we see we have a 26 year old male with frontal meningioma, uh, weighty image hyper, we have here hypervascularization of this uh, meningioma, although this degree of aid and the this degree of edema and necrosis uh, uh, might suggest in uh, aggressive malignant meningioma. The pathological differences uh, uh, was whole grade one meningioma, but uh, it is uh, uh, aspect of malignant uh, uh, meningioma. Very, very uh, hypervascularization and uh, uh, big uh, edema involved. So in pathologically proven intraventricular demonstrated, uh, you can hear these cases about intraventricular meningioma. You can see here, 
in the ventricle lateral uh, occipital horn here in axial view of CT scan and T2 here you see homogeneous of this uh, process and the enhancement uh, on T1. Malignant melangioma, you can see another case, parasagital mass with focal area uh, of increase in T2 intensity. And the uh, post contra enhancement you see here, uh, how grato melangioma, how involve, involvement about the calvarium, by, it is atypical, sometimes uh, they can meme, meme uh, like uh, osteosarcoma or, and uh, or, 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 uh, those tumor and but you can see here this feature that I talk about LCF who done the difference and uh, we have we can uh, uh, confirm that it is an meningioma so about parasite parasite uh, uh, classification we have sendu who classified meningioma like a tumor who attach Type one tumor attached to the outer surface of the sinus walls. The type two tumor fragment inside the lateral recess. Type three tumor invades the ipsilateral walls, and tumor invade uh, type type four tumor invades the lateral wall, wall and roof, and type five complete sinus occlusion with one free walls, and type six complete sinus occlusion without any free walls. The surgical treatment, surgery is the gold standard of management and the quality of removal is important to predict the outcome and recurrence. And we have uh, Simpson grad to define, uh, to define our quality of removal. So the Simpson grad one, it is a, a tumor who macroscopically complete tumor resection with removal of affected dura and underlying bone. When you remove the tumor, you remove the dura mater, you remove the, you remove the bone. That means uh, you perform uh, exerence of meningioma Simpson grade one. When we remove, we just remove microscopically complete tumor, and uh, we just we don't coagulation of affected dura only. That means Simpson grade two. Macroscopically complete tumor resection without removal of affected dura or underlying bone, because sometimes when you, uh, we have meningioma who invades sinus, like a carotid uh, uh, cavernous, cavernous sinus, or uh, attached uh, falx, and uh, it is hypervascular, you can remove all. We perform Simpson 3. When you perform subtotal tumor resection, like a big uh, uh, um, uh, meningioma uh, of sinus cavernous, you can go to, to, to remove all, impossible. And sometimes when it is very big and uh, you, uh, in uh, uh, like a uh, uh, meningioma of sphenoid, uh, um, uh, greater L of uh, sphenoid or uh, who big and uh, done compression of chiasma, sometimes you can just remove a part to decompress, uh, uh, to decompress. So in this case, we, uh, that means you perform Simpson grad five. Radio surgery gamma knife uh, uh, has had a prominent role in controlling progression of residual residual tumor. Failure of radio surgery after microsurgery in controlling residual disease has been reported to be as low as zero percent at four years follow up. 28 uh, uh, and as high uh, uh, as 30% as, at three years. This clearly compares favorably with progression rates of residual tumor of 32% at four years. The efficacy of radiosurgery has prompted surgeon to be, uh, to be less aggressive in recession tumor extension into the cavernous sinus or to accept a subtotal resection in case of high risk of post-operative uh, morbidity. So uh, about outcome, patient outcome, it is, uh, we talk about quality of life, Karnofsky performance uh, scale, uh, age, bio, um, psychosocial status, complications surgical and medial, disease outcome, 
And the, the surgical outcome extent of uh, resection morbidity or mortality is tumor size, location of, of uh, tumor, consistency of this tumor, vascularity of this uh, tumor, and the surgical experience, philosophy, and the technique. And uh, you have histopathology. Uh, so this is outcome progression free survival, overall survival recurrence, whole grade, proliferative marker, and the uh, extent of uh, resection. Contemporary surgical outcome according to the meningioma uh, location, you can see here. A bad location, we have olfactory groove, planum spinoidal, tuberculum cellae, meningioma of convexity, meningioma parasagital and falcine, meningioma medial sphenoid ridge, meningioma clinoidal, cavernous sinus meningioma. And when you, uh, you analyze, we analyze this. Uh, uh, a table you can see here when you, you take uh, olfactory groove, the recurrence come in uh, uh, about the oh, uh, and to 4.9 percent with mean follow up period of two uh, to uh, uh, five point uh, uh, twenty eight years, and the morbidity going to thirty percent. But the improvement uh, when we don't rem when we remove, you can have uh, some 100% uh, about improvement. But complication of surgery, you can have CSF leakage, seizure, infection, decreased visual uh, acuity. So all hyperostotic bone should be removed with the dura of the anterior school base to minimize the risk of recurrence. And preservation of olfactory function was likely if preoperative function was normal. When we take uh, a convexity, we can have a good rate about uh, uh, removal. You can have 90% uh, good rate about total excision. It is the only location uh, where you can have this good uh, rate uh, about total uh, removal, uh, like uh, Simpson one. And uh, uh, we can have less, uh, uh, less morbidity, less morbidity. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, zero mortality, zero mortality about, uh, about uh, management of, of, of conversity. I will go ahead. Uh, I, I see there's spam in French too. <laughs> yes. It's just a race out. Yeah, there we go. Let's click it. Yeah, there we go. Yes. So we can have uh, petrocleval. In petrocleval, we just have 40% uh, uh, about total uh, uh, removal. It is, uh, it is not uh, easy. Cerebellar pontin can have 18.2 to 18.6 uh, complete removal. For a med magnum, you can have uh, 67 to 96 percent uh, removal. Jugular for a man, tenteral intraventricular, you can have to 50 uh, to 100 percent in jugular and uh, 77 to 91 percent in tentorial. And uh, all this uh, improvement about uh, uh, symptoms. So uh, the results depend uh, on tumor location with, uh, with regard to functional preservation of facial nerves. Uh, was hearing pre pre uh, preservation was achieved in 67 to 19 percent about cerebellum uh, pontin uh, uh, angle. So in conclusion, meningioma is currently being tumor with good outcome. A typical and ana anaplastic meningioma has a strong recurrent potential with a poor prognosis. There is heterogeneity of prognosis in whole grade two meningioma. And uh, evidence suggests that patients have better outcome after tumor treatment by high volume specialized provider for a broad range of uh, tumor. So this is my reference. And, uh, I thank you for your for your attention. Thank you for your attention. Okay, very good, Narug. Excellent. Uh, you're blowing up a solid core. Also, of uh, let me get you off the uh, screen share. Can you just click off the screen share? Now? Uh, I can. I can do it. I can start the screen share, and that automatically bumps you off. Yes. Uh... There we go. 
you know, actually, I'm not a neurosurgeon, neuro, but I know that when I heard the when you hear the word brain tumor, obviously, people think the worst, and meningioma is such a common tumor that some people automatically assume when you say, oh, brain tumor, it's terrible. But yes. it's almost good news when you hear the word meningioma, correct? Yeah. If, because, uh, because the neurosurgeon or the ER doc or whoever, radiologist will say, oh, it looks like you may have a brain tumor. And automatically people assume it's malignant, glioma, et cetera. Uh, has that been your experience too? Yes, it is benign tumor. It is benign tumor meningioma. Yeah, it's good news almost to the patient. But, here, um, right? I would I would like uh, uh, to uh, to talk after um, about uh, uh, part of meningioma because we have meningioma of parasite. We have about look uh, about uh, location. We have type of right. meningioma, clinical uh, significance of this uh, uh, meningioma, and uh, how to manage. Um, this uh, uh, this meningioma in this location. So uh, in future, I will I will try I will uh, work uh, with uh, Ulrich to to down topic about uh, all this and uh, to to like that we can talk uh, uh, well and uh, and more with more details about uh, meningioma. But ob uh, obviously, it is uh, um, a, a, a tumor who is benign. Uh, and uh, when uh, uh, you don't, uh, we don't have involvement uh, about uh, cavernous sinus, about chiasma optic nerves. Um, uh, no, you can have involvement, compression about uh, chiasma optic, um, uh, sinus, uh, petrosal sinus in uh, petrocleval meningioma. Uh, in this case, we, uh, we are afraid about recurrence because we can remove all this tumor. Right. So in this case, we have high morbidity, uh, but uh, usually when we have meningioma of convexity, meningioma uh, who can remove, who can perform Simpson 1 or Simpson 2, uh, um, usually it is a good outcome and good uh, prognosis of, of, of the person. And it's important about the Karnofsky. Uh, statical uh, clinic of patient. If you have good Karnofsky, it is uh, uh, better for outcome and follow up postoperatory of, uh, of, uh, of patient. But uh, don't worry, Ulrich, uh, we can, you can remove uh, so soon one <laughs> million <of> convexity. <laughs> right. uh, Ulrich, have any comments or questions for uh, Nero? Uh, yes, your comment and approach uh, is uh, welcome. Um, well, the, the the presentation was great. So it was but really you give me yeah. big topic. So yeah, it's been handy, topic. or you're going to see that the or over you're going to see that the rest of your career. And then yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I think I think at the end of the obviously it's a big topic. But I, at the end of the day, you covered the the really essential aspects. And I think yes. uh, anyone who aspires to be a neurosurgeon will gain a lot if the person can remember, or even if it's just half of what you've said today. So um, it was really, it was really um, helpful. Uh, and John, you know, about, about your question, we never know, maybe on Facebook Live or YouTube Live, we have um, people that might be watching because they themselves or their family have uh, heard about brain tumors and meningioma. So the important thing for, for them is to know that, well, the biggest risk with this tumor, which is benign, is just compression. It's, it's compressing the location, a structure. Yeah, the location can yeah. cause compression. Location, location, yeah. yeah. Uh, unlike all that forms of, of tumors. And uh, obviously, we'll be happy to have Dr. Nuru to, to come back and give us more precisions on other forms of meningiomas. Right, dangerous yes. dangerous locations for meningiomas. Yes, yes. 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 petroclival, yeah. yeah. cavernous sinus. Yes, yes, we will talk about that uh, in the future. You know, as a resident, uh, are these kind of cases, uh, the first cases that you're given the knife, I mean, or some of the first cases, they start you on benign tumors, right? Cutting and stuff. Yes. How does that work? Uh, you do a lot of managing over when you're doing We We operate uh, the many cases, but it is step by step. Uh, okay. It is like me when I, I am in operatory room with my, uh, with my professor, I perform the, the approach. I perform the approach, uh, remove the bone, um, and uh, uh, the, uh, professor come 
and I helped uh, him to to done the devascularization, depulking, because I don't enter in the, all these details because when we have to talk about procedure of surgical, it is another topic about meningioma, how to, to, to remove that is another topic. So yes, uh, and uh, I perform many, many cases uh, with, uh, with my professor uh, about meningioma cases and uh, a lot of cases. And I done uh, last time, uh, I, I, I done one review about uh, different location you can have in meningioma of petroclival. I will uh, present uh, that uh, uh, after. Uh, okay, great. Right. Petro petroclival meningioma. And uh, it is uh, difficult uh, cases, but uh, when uh, you have a good experience in neurosurgery, you can perform that and reduce the, the morbidity risk and uh, uh, good uh, outcome to the, to the patient. To the okay, very good. Any closing comments? Uh... Yeah, I, I, I would say equally, I like that. I like the, the presentation because we, um, Dr. Nuru spoke about um, radio, radiotherapy and, and the, the health. Radio increase. surgery. Radio surgery. radio surgery, excuse me, excuse me, radio yeah. surgery, not radio therapy. Um, um, radio, radio surgery. Unfortunately, in sub-Saharan Africa, there are not a lot of um, uh, places no, that have radio in, surgery. Just in Morocco, just yeah, in Morocco, Morocco for yeah. example. Just so it, it's still it's still an issue, and by us learning this early, then maybe we can advocate for 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 new yes. for this to invest into radio radio surgery yes yes of course mm. of course it is very important because sometimes you can um, it, it is very simple to perform radio surgery to go to reoperate uh, the, the, uh, uh, patient because if you know that you perform like a uh, simpson tree uh, you have residual tumor uh, like uh, i don't know um, uh, sinus uh, cavernous you can perform radio surgery and uh, uh, you will have, uh, you will see that you have good control, like for five years, no recurrence, and uh, that is stabilization. And you will not uh, come back uh, uh, to hospital and uh, and and operate person if you not do that. And if like uh, you have uh, uh, grad two of uh, histolo histo histo histological uh, 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 grad two, if you have grad two of, of meningioma. You know that you have a recurrence, a, 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 a high risk of recurrence. So you have to go to uh, done adjuvant treatment. But you all, all uh, we know that radiotherapy classical it is not um, recommended now nowadays uh, about brain because we know uh, of, of patient uh, dementia neurological statue. Right. So now it is the challenge. It is to move to radio surgery after uh, uh, after surgery. But the first step to reduce tumor uh, tumor it is very important. First step is the gold standard is surgical treatment. If it is possible to remove all, remove all you can. And if if uh, they, uh, you have a residual tumor go to radio surgery it is better it is better uh, it is the best management now for meningioma yes. very good okay the real reason i got you here today uh Nauru, is for a tour of morocco yes but now i am in zurich now i am in oh, zurich. Zurich. Oh, okay well you, can you give us a tour uh, yes, i'm in zurich i come from this congress uh here but we we finished today so i will go i will come back uh i will i will leave uh I will leave uh, Zurich and go back to Morocco, right? Morocco. Ah, yes. I will go back to Morocco Sunday because uh, Saturday, tomorrow I will go to Paris to see my brother, and after I will go to. Oh, you have a brother in Paris? Yes, yeah, I have my little brother in Paris. A oh, little brother. What's he doing? What what kind of medicine is he doing? No, she she's not doctor. She's an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. He's smart. He got he didn't got his medicine. He don't he don't like it. <laughs> So me, ah, I see your your your. Yeah, could you please good. take us on a brief tour? Yeah, like, I mean, uh, Rabat. Hurricane. If you can follow, if you can see Rabat, it is, will be nice. Yeah, Rabat is in the south, right? Is it in the south? I don't know much about yes, Morocco. Yes, Rabat. Uh, yes. I'm trying um, to find it here. Uh, no, no, on top, on top. Come, come on top. Yes, yes, yes. 
Oh, there we are. It's on the coast. Yes, it is here. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. wow. I didn't realize Rabat. it's on the coast. Yes. Oh, I thought. Rabat. Okay, there you go. Yes, Khfein Rabat. Okay, and you're, uh, you have to... You drive to Gibraltar up there and to go to the, the ferry, take a cross, or how do you travel there? Uh, I don't understand you, John, you see? Yeah, how, how do you get up to Gibraltar? Do you drive or do you take a plane? Ah, yes, it is very, it is, yes, it is not so long. Gibraltar, España, Portugal, it is not so long to come to Rabat. It, it looks like a nice long. drive, very long yes, coast. One there. hour of uh, plane, uh, one hour of flight, uh, you, you, be, you will be in Rabat. Oh, okay, so the capital is Casablanca? Yes, oh. it is Casablanca. It's the, cap the economic capital. It is like in Cameroon, they have Yaoundé and uh, Douala. Uh, okay. In Morocco, uh, we have um, uh, Rabat and, and Casablanca. Rabat is the capital administrative and the uh, economic capital is Casablanca. Oh, it is okay. like in my country, in my country in Benin, we have uh, two cities, Porto Novo and uh, Cotonou. Cotonou is uh, um, economic capital and Porto Novo is uh, administrative uh, capital. I, I, I think you know that, Ulri. You know, you know Benin, Ulrich. You know my Yes, yes, I do. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, yes, I'm learning geography uh, in these series. You guys learn neurosurgery. I'm learning geography. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want, I want to come to my, my to Miami Beach uh, in this. Uh, oh yeah, uh, let me, let me <laughs> I will come. I will come. <laughs> Thank you guys on a little a little taste of it. Anyways, this this particular location is just um, Miami Beach is, blocks uh, away. Let me let me uh, oh, for uh, for again. summer. For me, uh, where are we here? I don't. How is that beach picture? Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, guys, eat your heart out. Let me move away. Thank you, John, and thank you, Lurik. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Nuru and, uh, and Ulrich, uh, again. Yes. And I apologize, we have more people here. Was, uh, we just had a glitch with, uh, with the Zoom, but uh, hopefully we'll have more people next time you present. Yes. Oh, no big deal, no big deal. No, don't worry. I will take, uh, very good. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. I'll send you a copy. Thank okay, you. thanks. Goodbye, Lurik. Goodbye, John, and uh, nice Bye, everybody. Okay.